you know, I wanted to ask you a, a particularly about what it was like for you working on Thunderstruck. And now that song is just like, it's like one of those songs that's just in the air all the time. How does that feel like, you know, working on something and it, then it's just part of existence, you know? Well, I have to say it's very surreal. In the studio, uh, most of the time you can't really tell what song's going to be the big hit or whatever. You know, occasionally you can say, oh, that's probably going to be one of the singles or or one of the hits. But that, you know, Thunderstruck really was just another song with a, you know, kind of a cool riff to it. I remember when we were doing it, though, uh, we had most of the song kind of redone, all the instruments redone. And I can't remember if we had Brian had sung on it yet or anything. But anyways, Bruce had said, hey, uh, and he says, yeah, we need something for the intro just to kind of get the song going. And he says, oh, he says, I've got this thing I've been working on. He says, you want to hear it? He says, yeah, okay. So hit record. And Angus lights a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> And he starts with that, right? So yeah. like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So we're recording, recording. Got through the first verse, and he's still going. So Bruce is saying, you know, keep the tape going. So Angus did that to the whole song, one take. And at the end, he stopped. And as I had this long ass, he goes, how's that, Bruce? <laughs> you know, Bruce says, oh, that was awesome. So we did it in one take through the whole song. So uh, we just left it like that. Uh, and in the mix, you can hear in sections we pulled it way down mm -hmm. but it's still it's still there it was only meant to be in the intro but <laughs> we ended up using it for the whole song so uh that was that was pretty cool but you know years later it's just amazing to hear that song come on and and it's like kind of one of their iconic songs now mm -hmm. you know it's up there was shook me and and back in black and all that it's like it's one of their their iconic songs and it's just so bizarre to say wow I, I did that one. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You know, a lot wow. of artists, um, when they get a song that's that big, they actually grow to resent it. At least they say that publicly. Do you know how ACDC feels towards the success of that song? You know, I don't think they resent it. I think they still love all their stuff. I think the only time a band resents some song is, is sometimes, you know, after playing it live for 30 years, they're like, okay, I'm sick of that song. I want to do something new because, you know, uh, musicians are creative creatures, so they okay, I, that, I did that. Okay, awesome. Now I want to paint this picture. I want to do that thing. And, you know, it's not, they don't want to be just stuck playing the same old song again, you know, where that's what the fans want. They want the hits, you know, so, but uh, I think ACDC just enjoys it. I know they do all their stuff for the fans. Hmm. You know, they, they uh, like Malcolm said once, he says, well, we make music that we like to listen to. And he says, hopefully the fans like it, but they do everything for the fans, you know, like even after a show, They've done, you know, they're two and a half, three hour show. They're coming out. There's a lineup of fans in the back, uh, that area there. And they'll stand there for an hour and sign and sign an autographs till every one of those fans have, a, have, have an autograph signed. You know, they're, they're that kind of band. So, you know, I, I got to ask you, you mentioned earlier about Thunderstruck that, you know, like any song you're working on, you don't really know if it's going to be a hit when you're working on it. Was there any point that, it kind of clicked like, okay, this is going to be a big song before it took off. No, not really. I mean, he knew there was something, uh, something to that song because of the way it builds and the way it builds. And you've been in thunderstruck, but you know, to have to think that it was going to be one of their stadium, their stadium songs or their their uh, signature kind of songs mm -hmm. was was uh, not you never knew that you know like say um play ball was a song that we thought okay that one's going to be big uh and i think even before we finished mixing the record it was announced it was going to be the theme song of the uh, was it the the playoff the baseball playoffs or something like that one of the networks were going to take so you thought okay that one's going to be huge you know it, it had its thing but it never turned into the the, yeah. the the anthem but you know that one you could tell okay that's going to be that's going to be grabbed onto, you know, but um, yeah, Thunderstruck was, uh, was, was a cool one. And I guess it's, it was years after the fact, as you saw it build going, Oh yeah. Okay. I can see that now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You worked on the mix for that one as well as the engineering, correct? Thunderstruck. Yeah. yeah. Was there, yeah. when you were engineering, like, was there anything interesting that you, like you mentioned that you kind of, you took Angus's riff and you kind of lowered it here and there throughout were there any kind of cool, funky things you did during the engineering? I mean, during the mixing of that song? No, but I know uh, consciously in my mind was this is going to be compared to Back in Black, which is uh, yeah. record Back in Black, yeah. which was like, you know, how do you even 
equal that or, or try to beat it. But, you know, that's kind of in the back of your mind, you know, please, please don't make this suck. Please make it sound, you know, at least as good as back in black or, you know, so that's in your mind. But when you're doing something, you don't, you're not trying to copy anything. So it was a, I remember it, that was a, a, not a difficult moment, but, you know, on, a, on our minds, like you're always trying to like, you know, because back in black, to, in my mind, is where they peak. You know, Highway to Hell was great, but back in black was the peak. And now, you know, a few records later, you're going to try and get them back up there again. So that's always the pressure's on, you know, can I do this? Oh, I don't, you know, so I remember that. But, you know, again, that, that band, everything is, it's less is more, you know, it's uh, becomes more powerful. So there's not a lot of mixing tech tricks or anything uh, no big delays on everything you know a little maybe some short delay on brian and that kind of stuff but you know it's just trying to get everything as big and as punchy as you can that's cool that's really cool you know do you yeah. remember aside from that really cool story you just shared with me with him doing that with the cigarette which is really that's as rock and roll as you get do you remember <laughs> do you remember working on the other parts of that song in the studio you know, not really, because it was just, oh, let's replace the guitars that were already there. You know, we weren't in heavy creative mode. It was just like, hey, we love that sound and just dial a sound up. So that was something that was not there that we recreated. So I, that's why I remember it. And the fact that he did it in one take. And it's a fairly complicated thing. I mean, I can't play that. Well, I can't play guitar anyways. But I couldn't <laughs> put that. And then all the way through in one take, you know, with a cigarette in your eye, you know, it's like, <laughs> For you, what is the legacy of that song? For you personally, as someone attached to it, and in general, in rock? I mean, like, you could argue that song is almost as big as Stairway. You know, like, it's one of those songs. So where do you yeah, put that yeah. song in the story of rock and roll? It seems to be in a lot of things. You know, you, in, online, then you see the guy that does the, the bagpipe thunderstruck with the fire coming out of yeah, it. That's and cool. then you see the, the country version of it. So it's pretty cool that, you know, when people start doing, you know, parodies and those kind of things of the song, you think, well, I guess... I guess that's a pretty big song. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, it just, I just feel like I got to pinch myself that I was even a part of it. You know, it, it sort of seems very surreal, especially, you know, put a bunch of years in between doing it. And now it's like, oh, was I, uh, was I actually there? <laughs> you know, so it's pretty cool. You know, uh, not that I was any part of writing or doing that, but it's almost feels like it's like one of my kids, you know, it's part of our, thing we did so it's like oh yeah that's pretty cool i'm glad that i was part of something that the world has really enjoyed you know that's kind of our our aim is to do things that people can enjoy so great you know when it comes to popular music rock and roll in general sometimes there's this idea out there that you got to be in your 20s to get a hit as a singer or your early 30s brian johnson was 42 when he recorded thunderstruck so right. what do you, what does that say about brian johnson's vocal abilities in your eyes well, you know, Brian does an amazing job and he's still doing it in his, when is he now, in his 70s, you know, but because it's such a high, high, um, you know, high note vocal, you know, and then the way he sings, he sings in his throat when you talk to any sort of vocal uh, coach or anything, that's like the wrong way to do. You're going to damage your vocal. So the fact that he's been able to sing like that for all these years, plus live, you watch those guys, they've got to run probably 25 mm -hmm. miles a night as mm -hmm. well as you know singing and yeah. that and you know i don't know i don't know how he does it so you know and everybody says oh he's not singing as high anymore and there's a well you know give him a break he's been doing it all his life and he's he's at a point where most people are retired and and golfing and sitting back on their couch so you know he's still yeah. doing it so i gave full props to brian man 100% man. When you're working with him in studio, is there anything unique he does when he approaches recording vocals or is it relatively straightforward with him? It's pretty straightforward. Um, Brian does like to hold a microphone as opposed to putting it in a mic stand. That's just how he's always, you know, done it live and how he's most comfortable. So with that, you got to watch because sometimes the cord will bump and you get bumps and crackles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's how he likes to do it. I know with Brandon, sometimes we'll set up the SM7 or on a stand, but Brian can sit and sing with the other mic, but we're actually picking up the other, you know, the, the mic on the stand. So there's ways around it, but that's sort of Brian's thing. And then uh, I don't know if he did the last couple records, uh, but all the most of the records I did with Brian, he smokes while he's singing too. Really? <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's got a little, a little going and just, you know, <laughs> 
That's hilarious, man. So he sings in what is technically a wrong technique, and he smokes when he's singing. So he's doing everything backwards, but it's working somehow, essentially. Yeah, that's that's his that's his voice. You know, that's that's how he does it. <laughs> that's amazing. That's so cool. So over the you've worked on six studio records with with the band as well as various other productions. Over these mm-hmm. six records, uh, with Brian in particular, has his approach to vocals stayed consistent, or has he experimented or changed at all during the different records you work with him? Well, I know after, uh, and I can't remember the chronological order, but probably after the second record I'd mm-hmm. done with him, you know, and as he starts to age, uh, he really got into working out and getting himself okay. in better shape. Plus, you know, they usually take about five years or so in between records and, uh, you know, Brian gets bored easy. So, he, you know, he was racing cars. Yeah. So to race cars at the level he raced at, he had to be in really good shape too to pull those G's going around corners and stuff. So I noticed him coming into the studio, he seemed to have more power. The older he got, the more power he got because, you know, he came in and he was really in shape. And uh, so, you know, I, that's probably the only change I could see. You know, his voice is always there. His, his attitude's always there. He's always got a great upbeat attitude. He's such a, a fun guy to work with, you know, like I said to him, uh, I said, well, when you're done, you know, with your rock and roll career, uh, you know, you could have a, a career in stand up comedy. Just, <laughs> you know, he, he just keeps everybody in stitches the whole time. Thunderstruck proves that you don't need to be in your 20s or even your 30s to sing on a hit song. Thunderstruck was released as a single on September 10th, 1990, a few weeks before Brian Johnson's 43rd birthday. It was released as the lead single from ACDC's 12th studio record, The Razor's Edge the full record itself coming out on September 21st, 1990. As is the case with many of ACDC's songs, Thunderstruck was written by the Young Brothers, Malcolm and Angus. Interestingly, as recently as 2020, Angus Young said in an interview that before the band performs live, he spends about an hour practicing, specifically for Thunderstruck. This is what he had to say. I have to sit down for an hour and make sure I've got my fingers warmed up to take on that track. It's got an unrelenting intricacy. I have to be confident whenever I play it. Now, over the years, at least initially, ACDC would embellish the story about the origins of Thunderstruck, saying that Angus Young came up with the idea after an airplane he got in got struck by lightning and almost crashed. In the liner notes for the 2003 re-release of Razor's Edge, however, Angus Young clarified where he actually came up with the idea for Thunderstruck. It started off from a little trick I had on guitar. I played it to Mal and he said, oh, I've got a good rhythm idea that will sit well in the back. We built the song up from that. We fiddled about with it for a few months before everything fell into place. Lyrically, it was really just a case of finding a good title. We came up with this thunder thing based on our favorite childhood toy, Thunder Streak, and it seemed to have a good ring to it. ACDC equals power. That's the basic idea. The music video for Thunderstruck was shot at Brixton Academy in London, England. The man who directed the video was David Millay, the same person who directed the music video for You Shook Me All Night Long. In his words, David wanted to create the ultimate music video, which really captured ACDC's live energy. The video features the band performing in front of an extremely energetic crowd of fans, and there are a lot of really innovative shots used throughout the video. The opening shot of the video is not at all how a music video typically begins. Instead of a wide shot establishing where the video is or a close-up of a person, the first shot of the video is from the perspective of a drumstick. The camera moves up and down with one of Chris Slade's drumsticks as it hits a cymbal. The second shot is a close-up from on top of Angus Young's guitar looking down across the fretboard. Arguably, the most memorable shots from the video are the ones from underneath Angus Young as he moves across the stage. In order to capture those, Angus Young walked across plexiglass as the camera filmed from underneath. As mentioned, Thunderstruck is one of the most iconic songs of all time, and as a matter of fact, it's ACDC's biggest song in terms of their mass popularity. For example, at the time of this recording, the music video for Thunderstruck has close to 890 million views. The second highest ACDC video is Back in Black, with approximately 720 million views. Now, for any artist of any genre, 890 million views is a big number. But what really jumps out to me about that figure is that Thunderstruck was released before YouTube existed. So unlike the artists of today, it wasn't initially released to YouTube and immediately promoted. Which means that on its own, essentially, the song has risen to nearly the billion mark. Now, what's interesting is that despite how huge of a song Thunderstruck is, it didn't reach the number one spot on any of the charts in the US, the UK, or Australia. It did reach the number one spot in Finland, however. It peaked at number 4 in Australia, number 13 on the UK singles charts, and number 5 on the US mainstream rock charts. Which goes to show that a song doesn't need to be a number 1 single in order to have massive cultural impact. When you're at a sporting event, chances are Thunderstruck will be played on the PA. If you're at a convenience store, it may be playing quietly in the background. It's one of those songs which has transcended boundaries and is just a part of life. 
The song has also appeared on various TV commercials and movies. One of the first examples of Thunderstruck being used in this context was for the 1999 American comedy movie Varsity Blues. Now, licensing for music for movies can be an expensive procedure, but there's expensive and then there's expensive. According to Thomas Golubic, who worked as the music supervisor for the film, they were charged $500,000 to use Thunderstruck in their movie. He once recalled the following. I remember being absolutely horrified when I heard that number, and we spent a lot of time coming up with what we thought were great alternatives, but there was going to be no budget on that, and they had money, so they paid for it. Now, as mentioned, Thunderstruck was released as the first single from The Razor's Edge and is also the opening song on the record. The Razor's Edge was produced by Bruce Fairborn at Little Mountain Sound Studios in Vancouver, Canada. In terms of the name of the record, The Razor's Edge, Angus Young once offered the following explanation. The Razor's Edge comes from an old saying farmers used to use in Britain. When you'd have a fine sunny day, you'd know a very good day with a hot sun, and then all of a sudden, right in the distance, you could see these black clouds coming over the horizon. An ominous thing. I thought it was a great title. The world was at peace again, and everyone thought, ah, oh, the Berlin Wall's come down, and it's all going to be fun and games, a party every night. And you can see now that it's not that way. It's just our way of saying the world's not perfect and never will be.